It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 308 of Science on Top. Today is Monday the 3rd of September 2018. I'm Ed Brown and on the show today is Penny Dumsday. Hello. Lucas Randall. Hello. And a geneticist working at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute, Dr. Carolyn DeGraff. Welcome back. Hi there. Okay, on today's show, dark microbes, the genes of cannabis use, dark energy and string theory, and some very, very vintage cheese. But three small announcements before we get started. Uh, scienceontop.com slash donate is where to go if you want to become a Patreon and support the show. You get to pick how much you donate per episode. You get different rewards accordingly. Uh, a big thanks to all our generous Patreon supporters. Uh, also, another big announcement. Dr. Pamela Gay will be giving a talk, a Q&A session, and joining us for a live recording of the show in Melbourne, Australia, on Wednesday, October 10th. I'm really looking forward to it. She's an astronomer and co-host of the Astronomy Cast podcast. I don't think it's an overstatement to call her the best of the best when it comes to astronomy communication. I agree. So this is your chance to get any questions you have answered about space, about the universe, careers in science, astronomy in particular, any of that. That's Wednesday, October 10th. Tickets are $20 and all proceeds go to the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, which does terrific citizen science and education and outreach works. Just go to scienceontop.com slash live to grab your tickets. At scienceontop.com slash live. But if you can't make it to Melbourne to see Pamela, she'll also be talking in Sydney at the Australian Skeptics National Convention on that weekend, uh, October 13th and 14th. There will also be talks by loads of other interesting people. Um, Dr. Susan Blackmore, who's a psychologist, lecturer, and author. Uh, She's written uh, books about out-of-body experiences, consciousness, memetics. She's a fascinating speaker. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing her talk and everyone else at the Skeptics National Convention. convention Convention.skeptics.com.au for all the details on that. Of course, we'll have all those links in the show notes. So let's get on with the show. And the largest analysis of genetic information on lifetime cannabis use has identified 35 genes that can influence you to take up marijuana use. Carolyn, this was a pretty huge study, and it also found links to those genes with other drug dependencies, ADHD, autism, depression, and a whole host of other things, didn't it? Yeah, this was a... Yeah, really big study. It had 180,000 um, people involved. And it's a genome-wide scan, so they've looked all the way across the genome to see which regions might be linked to these particular traits. So you don't normally get to do studies that are this big, but they started to put together data from 23andMe, um, the UK Biobank, and also samples from the International Cannabis Consortium. Or I guess volunteers from International Cannabis Consortium. Um, and this gets you quite a lot of people. I was just going to, like, I, I just have it in my mind that the International Cannabis Consortium <laughs> are just very relaxed, just kind of just sitting back, just really totally relaxed, and they so dude a lot. Is that, am I showing a bias? <laughs> Maybe I'm showing a bias here. I was expecting it to be more of a cartel, but uh, <laughs> consortium. Well, they- <laughs> it's just, it's like all the drug dealers got together and said, this is what we're going to do. But um, We're going to find out how we're going to genetically hook people on this stuff. Yes. Yeah. And they've found, and it seems like they've found the traits that make you want to use it a lot. Yeah. I like also that this is using 23andMe uh, data because there was a big controversy recently with uh, 23andMe and I think a few other um, genome 
testing consumer genome testing sites about privacy and using your genetic data for uh, giving it to third parties for research and things this is at least possibly a good outcome of that there are various hypothetical bad side effects from that but yeah i mean i've actually got a 23andme profile yeah me too um Partially so that, you know, as I'm reading genetic studies, I can be like, oh, do I have that one? Or, oh, I, have that one? <laughs> yeah, I think there's um, a danger. Can I go of, mad? Yeah. <laughs> Which admittedly I haven't actually put into practice very much, you know, since I got it. But the theory was there. That's kind of nice that you can be looking, you know, rather have it be something kind of hypothetical, you can check it out. It's probably not as, yeah. Probably not as bad as med students, you know, diagnosing themselves with every disease that they read about. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't feel like I've been blown away with what I've learned from it. I mean, but this is possibly a study that shows that a little bit. So they've found 35 different genes that are associated with cannabis use. But even with all those different genes, it only explains 11% of the variance in um, whether you're likely to use cannabis or not. That seems really low. Yeah, I mean, so you do, so I mean, because they've got 180,000 people, um, it's a pretty, you know, they can definitely detect these things, but the chances of whether you use it a lot seem like they're much strongly, more strongly environmentally influenced. Um, Which makes sense, because whenever you get these nature versus nurture arguments come up, I'm always on the side of, sure, nature probably plays a part but surely we're vastly the product of our environment and our experiences to do these sorts of things. I would have yeah, thought. I mean, I guess it really depends which traits you're looking at, how strongly influenced they are. So you go from something like Huntington's, which is, you know, if you've got a particular risk allele for that, it's you've got a you know, very, very strong chance that you're going to get it um, to something like this, where, you know, if you had one of them, it's not going to explain that much. If you've maybe got 20 pointing you in the right way, then you're probably a bit more likely to, you know, quite reasonably likely to have it. But even so, you get a lot of say in whether you do it or not. And I guess whether you get put in the path, um, you know, of <laughs> various bits of weed, it will be whether you take it up or not. Sure. Okay. So a week a weak link, but definitely a link with these genes. Definitely a link with these genes. Yeah. And, um, so I suppose the thing that makes me uh, trust this particular study more than some of the others is the large number of studies, they, large number of people they've got involved in it um, and that there's been a couple of studies beforehand with the smaller numbers and they're picking up the same genes that those ones managed to get. So it's replicating their previous work. And they Right, because we had seen a link between um, cannabis and schizophrenia before, although I think there was some contention about that, but this sort of solidifies that link. Yeah, well, I think it's showing it with more um, larger numbers of people. And they've also been able to look at the expression of these genes in cannabis users versus non-cannabis users and showing that um, for some of these genes, some of them, you know, show higher expression in the cannabis users than the lower users so it's not just that there's genetic variant, but they've, I guess they've got perhaps a mechanism so how this might be passed on, I mean, how it might be having its influence on people. Right. So is there also a bit of a uh, sort of a cause and effect here? I mean, we've shown, uh, this study shows that there's a genetic link between cannabis use, tobacco and alcohol use, uh, schizophrenia and all of that. But is it not necessarily that those genes lead to that, but people who have those genes for other possible reasons maybe they are what i guess i'm trying to say is they might be more likely to depression or something and thus self-medicate with alcohol abuse or cannabis abuse yeah i thought this was a really interesting part of the study because i guess there's always been this idea that if you took cannabis it might lead to something like schizophrenia um because i guess people would you know use it in their teens and the symptoms of schizophrenia wouldn't develop until they're in their 20s so it seemed like the cause might be in that direction. Um, but with genetic traits, you've got this um, great control experiment set up at conception where you're randomly assigned whether you get a particular allele or not, um, and it's fixed all the way through your life, so you know that whether you use cannabis or not isn't going to change what your genes look like, whether you have schizophrenia isn't changing your genes. Um, so what they've done is they found that those who have the um, risk allele of this CAD-M2 gene 
they've got a high chance of being both schizophrenic um, and users of cannabis. So then they looked at non-users who had this particular risk allele and they found out that they still had a higher chance um, of getting schizophrenia even without using um, cannabis. Um, but then if you looked at it in the reverse way, if, in non-schizophrenics, um, they didn't have any difference in cannabis use if they had the risk allele. So it seemed like it was the cause was going from having schizophrenia to wanting to use cannabis. So it's a fairly broad study then if it wasn't just sort of looking at the link between cannabis and uh, those genes, but it's those genes in cannabis, it's those genes in schizophrenia and uh, the links between all of those as well. That's a pretty complicated study, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think this kind of Mendelian randomization, which is what they call this thing where they try and tease out whether there's cause and effect between two different traits and it's uh, and a gene behind it. Um, you can do this with the t- things like the 23andMe data because they've got so many different phenotypes on it. Um, so they haven't just asked them one question about what you know, they've asked them, you know, so what's your weight? You know, do you get anxious in this situation? Do you enjoy um, having uh, coriander and all this kind of stuff? So they've got a lot of different phenotype information on people and they've really tried to leverage it into this study and looking at all these different traits. So it's all self-reported, um, which I suppose in itself can lead to problems. You know, maybe with things like the cannabis, that's also sure. self-reported. I guess also because this is linked to your genetic data, you kind of lose that anonymity that you might have with other self-reported studies. So people might feel more comfortable admitting to cannabis use or something to a researcher who they're never going to see again. But if it's giving your, if it's filling out a form on a website for a company that has your entire genetic details, you might be a little bit more cautious i guess yeah i think you would really want to trust them and that they're not gonna this data is not going to be linked back to you in any public way Mm. so so far i think that's been pretty well looked after and i imagine if they know where their bread's buttered they will have their this really locked down sure but i think with with companies like this often start off with very good intentions and policies but over years, as the competition gets more intense and as thing that the culture changes and the environment that they're working in changes, things can tend to slip a little bit. Um, you know, we all trusted Facebook a lot more in the early days than we do now, I think. So, I don't know. I'm speculating wildly. Yeah, well, I guess, well, you know, my data's in there now. So, I mean, I think I'm being more cautious yeah. about what I fill in and <laughs> to see where it is. Fair enough. Um, you know, they could have my details about, you know, my enjoyment of coriander or otherwise, but for other things, I guess I prefer mostly to keep it to myself. You're not going to report your, you're not going to tell them all about your drug habits. (laughs) Well, you never know, do you? (laughs) 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 Ah, very good. All right. Well, let's move on to a study that was published in the journal Current Biology which has found that microorganisms in colder climates will darken themselves to capture more heat and improve their chances of survival. Penny, this is kind of the opposite to what humans do. I mean, um, the humans in warmer countries with a lot of sunlight have evolved to have darker... Actually, it's the other way around. People who have gone into colder and darker climates have evolved Mm. lighter skin. I have no real point to saying that other than it's vaguely interesting no, i think it's interesting and the reason i found this interesting was it is interesting to think of that link between um pigmentation and heat and how it plays out in different evolutionary contexts because yeah as we found with humans having lighter skin i think enables you to sort of absorb more vitamin d so in a really dark climate that's kind of a good thing but you can also notice that for example um I know in the Australian summer, I would much rather get into a white car than a black car because the white car has, you know, a, or it doesn't heat, seem to heat up as much and we, as those dark colours. So we know that um, dark colours do absorb sort of more energy from heat and light. And apparently this is quite a common 
um, strategy, evolutionary strategy in some cold-blooded animals. So things like lizards and grasshoppers tend to adapt to different temperatures in the environment by producing more melanin in their skin. So these kinds of animals need to um, use external heat to maintain their temperature. And one way to get a bit more external heat is to be a darker colour. So what I thought in, was interesting is not just how this plays out differently between, you know, endothermic animals or animals like humans that make their own body heat and other animals, but also to see this in microbes. So there's apparently lots and lots of pigmented fungi, bacteria and other kinds of microbial, microbial communities and they exist at cold latitudes. So what this study found was when looking at um, 20 differently pigmented variants of yeasts, um, candida and cryptococcus, they found that the darker ones heated up faster and reached higher temperatures under ordinary sunlight as well as um, infrared and ultraviolet radiation. Um, they became warmer by I think about 10 degrees than the lighter ones and this also seemed to enhance their survival. So um, if it was 23 degrees, their test microbe um, the melanin one declined by about 25% compared to a no melanin. So what that's saying is if temperatures are kind of tropical 23, the one that's darker is less likely to survive. But if the temperature is 4 degrees C, then the light ones sort of die off and the darker ones could grow. So it does seem that this adaptation or the colour of microbes might be relevant to their survival at different um, latitudes. What I also found fascinating was that this could be something that really needs to be factored into um, calculations to do with climate change. So these um, dark pigmented microbes can grow really, really well in polar regions and they can seem to actually darken the colour of the snow. And so this is actually then will mean that um, those regions might absorb more heat as a whole and heat up more quickly. And, mm. yeah, so, I uh, look, I don't like to say, well, we're just doomed. But, I mean, the more information <laughs> that we have about this is better. I mean, props to these plucky little microbes for um, figuring out a survival strategy in a polar latitude. But also... Um, yeah, like the more information we have, the better we can understand and model what's happening with climate. And yeah, oh, it's, it's quite interesting. It is. And I think 10 degrees is pretty significant temperature change yeah. to go to. That's, that's yep, impressive. For a microbe, I mean, that's a massive difference between life and death, 10 degrees. It is huge. Like I found that quite um, astonishing really. And um, as you say, with uh, the climate mm. change, it's also interesting because we do know that um, we, we've seen that as glaciers melt, uh, there are blooms of microorganisms uh, in the meltwater. We've seen that happen. Um, presumably, some of them are also going to be these dark variety or the ones that darken to adapt. So worrying. But as you say, mm. more information, the better. All right, Lucas, do you want to tell us about whether or not String theory and dark energy are compatible. And do you want to first of all give us a quick summary of what those two things are? Dark, so, oh god, <laughs> a quick summary of string theory. Easy, isn't a it? Quick summary of string theory <laughs> and then a quick summary of dark energy that we don't know what it is and don't understand it. Okay, um, cool. So, uh, dark energy is a placeholder name for something that appears to be driving the expansion of the universe. Um, it's, it's not understood what it is, but it makes it up a significant percentage of the universe as a whole. And it makes itself known basically in, in our observations. That's where we're, we're seeing the impact that whatever it is that's driving the expansion of the universe, um, is uh, it, you know it's it's clearly there, and it's not only expanding the universe, but it's accelerating the expansion of the universe. So it's a very strange, strange um, thing that we can't really reconcile with with the other, you know, things that we do understand so far. Not to be confused, of course, with dark 
um, matter, which is a, di a completely different thing that we don't understand. Um, <laughs> and uh, we've done plenty of episodes on that stuff, so uh, I suppose go back to those. But dark matter is is, um, is a completely different thing. String theory is a thing that is, is um, arguably... Um, the best candidate for unifying the theories of, of gravity and quantum fin physics. So um, at the moment, there's a divide between um, our understanding of how gravity works and the strong and the weak nuclear forces and the quantum world. The quantum world doesn't really fit in. And, and this is something that Einstein spent the latter part of his career trying to reconcile, trying to figure out what on earth, you know, how these things could coexist uh, together. And one of the examples of that is you you, um, you consider a black hole, which which in Einstein's time was, was a, uh, a theoretical uh, uh, thing. Um, now, you know, the evidence is very, very strong that they're real. Um, but if you, if you look at the... Uh, the models of black holes that largely come out of Einstein's equations uh, on the surface of a black hole, the the, the event horizon, um, his his you know general theory of relativity breaks down. Uh, relativity breaks down. It no longer describes the universe in that place, and this is where quantum physics uh, has to step in to to describe what's going on. And this is all about um, this is this is all about um, uh, uh, random um, statistical relationships, and it's it's really really weird. And the the thing that I guess has, I've struggled with, and I'm sure I'm not alone with this over the years, is uh, even having read many things about string theory, um, which which describes a, a largely mathematical con, uh, you know, sort of um, universe, or well, not universe. It's actually multiverses if if you uh, uh, if you you follow through, but it, it describes a mathematical construct which allows for the creation of the universe as we know it and for the balancing of all of these equations between, um, you know, between relativity and, and quantum f uh, physics, uh, which we can't really do in, in the, um, within the constructs, uh, c constraints of the universe we live in. Uh, of, often they, they imply that there are multiverses, um, that there are, um, you know, either 12 or 24 or many other, you know, numbers of different universes. And um, it's, yeah, it's weird, it's wonderful, and it's one of those things that I think I've always had, the biggest issue I've always had with it is that it's largely untestable because we don't really have a way of stepping outside of our universe to another universe to test some of this stuff. So, you know, if you're looking at a scientific theory, you you really part of a theory is it needs to be it needs to be falsifiable, and it's really difficult to do that with a, a completely mathematical model like this. However, that said, <laughs> um, uh, we may not have been able to falsify string theory, but it does appear that string theory itself predicts that our own universe shouldn't exist and the, that to me flies in the face of observation because i'm that's, i don't think i'm alone it's a bit of a kick yeah i've take, noticed right? our universe i've seen it like i've I, it's it's <laughs> definitely here unless we're one of unless or right unless you? we're in some kind of matrix or in mm. someone else's reality or something like that but <laughs> but certainly you know to the best of our knowledge the universe does exist and a paper that that has uh, recently been uh, um, uh, written and and um, presented by a very prominent string theorist, uh, Cameron uh, Varfa from Harvard University, and uh, and some other collaborators. Basically, he uh, put forward this uh, apparently quite a simple formula. I mean, I say simple. Yes, I mean I understood it, of course. <laughs> um, <laughs> dictating. Yeah. It's only four blackboards long. <laughs> We're basically dictating which kinds of universes are allowed to exist and which are forbidden. And um, and ours is in the latter. So this string theory permits over 10 to the 500 different solutions. There's You could spend many, many lifetimes. That's yeah, a that's, that's, that's a lot. That's quite a lot. Um, but among them... Um, is not one. Uh, it seems very unlikely that uh, that our universe can exist, and the, and the sticking point is actually that dark energy. Um, so both of these things are pretty exciting, right? I mean, 
it's exciting for the string theorists because they're going, oh my god, um, we've just shown the universe doesn't exist. That's awesome. No, they've said, um, oh my god, we've we've either got a problem with with our side of things, or cosmologists have a problem in their understanding of the cosmos. Which is it? Stay tuned to find out. We don't know. Um, but I, I, I do. guess they're really hoping they haven't give, got themselves out of a job there. Well, but the thing is, it's one of those, it's one of those, um, those theories that there's so many different permutations of, you know, as as you heard, there's there's like ten to the five hundred different solutions. It's, um, you know, it's gonna, <laughs> it's gonna be one of those things that they could probably just stay employed for the rest of the time, just, uh, just working on this one problem. Um, but no, I, I think what jumped out for me is that. And I didn't finish explaining why this is uh, what, what's wrong. The issue is that um, the the vacuum of, of empty space um, it it has to be it has to have this this dark energy in it, and that's something that we've known for quite some time. Basically, this goes back to like the late nineties when when we we observed that you know that the universe is expanding and it's expanding at a, at a faster rate, but the amount of dark energy um, uh, that's that's infused in space um, apparently uh, stays constant over time. Now it doesn't it doesn't increase, and that's a really weird property because it's space itself is expanding. The amount of dark energy in it does does not increase, but it is driving the expansion ever faster. Um, so that's that's really bizarre. But the, these new string theory um, equation. Uh, asserts that that the vacuum energy has to be decreasing, and that's not what we're seeing. So yeah, this is why it's basically incompatible. But uh, I do it, this to me was one of the first indications that maybe there is, there are in fact some ways to falsify. Because if it makes predictions that we can confer, you know, we can actually compare to reality and compare with observations, then we have a falsifiable theory, which is what we want. So. Yeah, I like it. It's 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 really cool, and and it's almost snuck under the radar there because I hadn't noticed this story until till Ed sent me the link. So very cool. <laughs> it is very cool. Always interesting to see how these things play out. I love this sort of what science to me is kind of this battlefield of different uh, explanations and theories all competing until we find out which yep. one is true. And it's a whole lot of people uh, trying to prove everyone exciting. else wrong. I mean, it's 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 this is why it's such a self-correcting thing because, um, and and I always find it so amusing when when you know conspiracy nutters and so forth. Apologies if you're a conspiracy nutter and I've just disparaged you, um, but you're a nutter. Um, yeah. So if if you know people, the conspiracy theorists, um, you know, will will claim that scientists are covering this stuff up, you know, and things like the moon landings that never happened, that despite the thousands of people that were involved who've all magically kept their mouths shut, when you can't even keep <laughs> the new Doctor Who set secret, right? And that's just a limited <laughs> number of people. But then you've got, you know what I mean? It's just, it's just absurd. So in a, in, a, in a world where the entire point is to prove things wrong, um, you know, it just seems... It, it's one. This particular discipline has always bothered me because of the lack of falsifiability. So we will see. Don't know if we'll see it our time, but yeah, stay tuned. Believing in conspiracy theories does not make you a nutter. Believing in conspiracies that are plainly ridiculous and didn't happen that makes you a nutter because there have been conspiracies. <laughs> oh, for sure. I'd, absolutely <laughs> not saying there's no conspiracies. Um, there's been some recent conspiracies at our workplace. Yeah, about uh, you know about the kitchen and so forth. I won't get into oh, that. Oh. I'm looking at you, Jan. Whoa, um, but uh, not Jan from accounting. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 different Jan. No, <laughs> but yeah, right. yeah. Well, let's move on because I didn't realise that Memphis <laughs> was actually the capital of ancient Egypt, but apparently it was in the 13th century BC. Memphis in Egypt, not Tennessee, and in the ruins of this once great city. The tomb of Tamez was discovered by treasure hunters in 1885. It was then lost, as you do. Great big tomb, easy to lose track of. And a hundred years later, it was rediscovered. Archaeologists found in that tomb a few broken jars. What, Penny, was in those jars? Well, 
move over treasures of King Tut because here was the world's greatest treasure, um, a 3,200-year-old cheese. Cheese. Uh, cheese, my, the favorite, my favorite food group. Um, so... <laughs> So, look, I think it's probably not a surprise. People have been making a cheese, cheeses for a long time. It's a really great way to preserve dairy. Um, it's also um, obvious, well, not obviously, but over the past 3,200 years, it has been contaminated. It's been flooded by the Nile. Um, there's been heavy rainfall. So, the cheese is not in like perfect condition for analysis. However, um, there's still a bits, a few bits of proteins lying around in there, um, including casein protein from cow milk and sheep or goat milk. So it seems to be kind of a mixed cheese. It would have apparently had a very, very sharp taste, but quite uh, nutty, or not nutty, quite spreadable. Um, huh? However... That wasn't the only thing that was found, which I feel is pretty cool anyway to just be able I'm to find already. traces and say, yes, this came from, you know, a mix of cow and sheep and goat or, yeah. or goat. It was also uh, not the best cheese. It was infected by a, well, probably or possibly infected by a species of bacteria, um, Brucella melitensis, uh, which causes the disease brucellosis, which comes with... Uh, Symptoms including fever, sweating, and muscle pain. And you can get that by eating or drinking unpasteurized or raw dairy products, which I guess in those days everything was. They hadn't discovered yeah. pasteurization. <laughs> they hadn't discovered the wonderful, wonderful process of pasteurization. So, look, I guess this finding doesn't change the world. Uh, people had cheese. They maybe mixed it with whatever milks they had around to make the cheese. Um, possibly it was infected with quite unpleasant bacteria that wouldn't have boded well for the people who ate it. I mean, I guess none of these are particularly, you know, really rewriting our understanding of ancient life. But I, I just like this because I feel it, for me, it made the past a bit more human. Like someone bothered to put like a big jar of cheese covered up with cheesecloth in a tomb and want to bury him with a treasure that he loved yeah you know what you need in the you know in the next life mm. yes well, exactly look, hopefully whoever buries me will remember my, my <laughs> <feeling>. <laughs> cheese <laughs> some afterlife cheese mm. but uh, i mean you said at the start it was probably not surprising that people have been having cheese for thousands of years I find it surprising that we're having cheese at all. I mean, who came up with the idea of getting a jug of milk and then putting a bit of sheep's stomach in it and mm. leaving it for a few months in the cool and then trying it when it was this crusty, chunky, chewy, yellowy, delicious, fantastic yep. creation? <laughs> I must admit, though, I think that uh, with in, like watching cooking shows, you th I think to myself... Whoever thought to do this process to, that, to yeah. just see yeah. what would happen? Yeah. And who would have thought that would have turned out something so delicious? It's just bizarre. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm with you. Food science. That's where it's at. That's it. People, if you want a new career, get into food science. It's probably the only science still making my... Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry. Sorry. I, yeah. But more to the point, you say they think it tastes like that. Uh, when are we going to find out how it actually tastes? Who's going to be the lucky one to try it? I'm not going to be volunteering to like recreate <laughs> brucellosis infected cheese. <laughs> it's not going to kill you. It just mm. makes you sweaty and have a fever for a bit. We can live with that. Oh yeah. You want to be the first person to have eaten Ancient cheese, cheese in 3,000 years. Maybe that's what the, put them in the tomb in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> Their love of cheese is the downfall. Mm. But because uh, it does remind me of, um, we didn't talk about it on the show, but there was that um, uh, that coffin that they found in, what well, was a tomb in Egypt a few months ago oh, and that had this bottle of the, wine. Yeah, they wanted to drink it. And there's the this petition that yeah. people signed to say someone's going to yeah. drink it. And didn't it turn out the wine was actually sewage that had leaked from the building above it or something? I did not hear oh. that, but it's even it funnier if true. Yep, it wasn't even wine. It was just, yeah, this is just, this is actually your neighbour's poo. That's what this is. I've often said Egyptian wine is pretty shit. Um, <laughs> I don't know. 
I apologize. I've never had Egyptian wine. I'm sure it's lovely. I like the coffee. Egyptian coffee is really good. There you go. What about 3,000-year-old Egypt? We don't know. Anyway. Uh, mate, it wouldn't surprise me in the hipster world we live in that there is some cafe in Melbourne serving 3,000-year-old Egyptian wine. Or, sorry, Artisanal uh, age yeah, 3,000 That has years. gone through the bowels of a, of a mummy or something. You know, it, it, I'm sure there's something there. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone's like, oh, it's just the best. Yeah. Have a shave. <laughs> <laughs> he says as he strokes his beard. <laughs> and on that cheerful and slightly <laughs> hypocritical note, uh, as always, all the links we talked about are in the show notes and on the web, scienceontop.com slash 308. Don't forget, you can help us out by going to scienceontop.com slash donate and pledging to support us on Patreon. And remember, Dr. Pamela Gay, live in Melbourne on Wednesday, the 10th of October. Go to scienceontop.com slash live to get your tickets. It was great to have you back on the show, Dr. Carolyn DeGraff. Oh, it was good to be back. Now, I think I'm going to go have some cheese. Yeah, yeah. I'm wanting cheese too. <laughs> I think we've all got cravings now. Cheese and wine. <laughs> And, of course, a big thanks to you, Penny and Lucas. Thank thanks, Ed. And thank you to everyone for listening. We'll be back again next week. Think science on top of the agenda. Join us then. We all know the problem. We all know the causes. We all know the solutions. And all that is left would be some political courage, some political guts to get out, tell the people of your country, do this, this is a certainty of disaster. And any leader of those country who believes that uh, there is no climate change, I think he ought to be taken to a mental uh, confinement. Uh, he is utter stupid. <laughs> and I say the same thing for any leader here who says that there is no climate change.